It is our suffering that brings us together. It is not love. Love does not obey the mind and turns to hate when forced. The bond that binds us is beyond choice. We are brothers. We are brothers in what we share. In pain, which each of us must suffer alone, in hunger, in poverty, in hope, we know our brotherhood. We know it because we have had to learn it. We know that there is no help for us but from one another, that no hand will save us if we do not reach out our hand. And the hand that you reach out is empty, as mine is. You have nothing. You possess nothing. You own nothing. You are free. All you have is what you are and what you give. Hey, this is Nick. Hey, this is Eric. And this is David. Welcome to another episode of the Books of Some Substance podcast. Today we are talking about Ursula K. Le Guin's 1974 novel, The Dispossessed, a, an ambiguous utopia, which is the subtitle it gained over time, which uh, follows a, a scientist named Shevik who's dealing with time and he travels to another planet and experiences patriarchal capitalism and the novel sort of investigates that and his home planet's sort of anarcho-communism. So I think maybe we can start with that subtitle, which I, I, I read that it, it was originally a descriptor on the, on the first publication, which called it an investigation into an ambiguous utopia, and then it just became an ambiguous utopia as kind of a subtitle on a lot of the editions of the book. Is it ambiguous? Is my first question. <laughs> yeah, I think that's where I'm going. I feel like this is very not ambiguous. This is this is black and white ideas on the black and white sheet of paper. I agree, but I also think that the way she sort of explores it is a little muddled. I mean, in some ways, I think the ambiguous utopia is sort of sort of like a catch-all. A few years later, because the for me the 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 ideas and and the things she was espousing just felt really muddled to me it it wasn't so much that it was black and white although it's certainly that too it just I was just frustrated with the the, both on one side the lack of clarity and b the sort of simplistic nature in which a lot of these things were argued and so um that's where I think maybe the title comes (laughs) from (laughs) not to be cynical but (laughs) the the subtitle is an insult to the book you're about to read (laughs) (laughs) well it's just it's kind of like you know, we, we, she didn't quite get it. So here's, you know, a subtitle that acknowledges that maybe it's an imperfect sort of organism, but one that maybe is still worth reading if you're interested in these utopian ideas. I think that's something worth discussing. Is there's part of me that thinks it's done on purpose. I think it is. I think she purposely complicated the utopian world of Anaris. It wasn't... Were we meant to think it was a utopia? Well, I think, I mean... Yeah, the fact that it got muddled, I think, is, in my opinion, the number one kind of redeeming aspect of this book is that the parts yeah. that I legitimately got into were some of the, um, I don't know, more subtle criticisms of what, uh, you know, the anarchist utopia was. Because the criticisms of um, Eurus were super obvious and blatant. And I mean, that was just so heavy handed that I almost wanted to be like, yeah, I know we, we, we get this, right. This is terrible. <laughs> it's, it's obvious. We know. Um, but some of the developments in Anaris, I think were actually showed some level of progression and some level of introspective, introspective thought into how these societies might operate. And I think that's, that's the positive stuff in this. Uh, but at the end of the day, it, it, to me felt very prescriptive and very black and white because it was it was something that was formulaic, and that sort of exploration of the holes and the gaps and the difficulties of this non hierarchical society and stuff um, offered a little bit of a of a carrot uh, into sort of a, you know examining a character's agency and how we operate in these societies and independence versus not. Um, but I, I still think it kind of fell a little bit short in sort of having that balanced, nuanced view into you know basically the pitfalls of human nature. That was my issue, and I don't know if that's where you're going, but that's kind of where you ended, which is that the society, the supposedly anarchist society on Anaris, it touches on human nature only a little bit, and it seems to ignore 
the, I guess, the fundamental selfishness of human nature. Although there, there's, it's there, especially in his, uh, his playwright friend, whose name I can't remember now off the top of my head, mm-hmm. who ends up being driven insane. If we remembered it, we, I think it's we probably t- couldn't. Tyrion, right? Yeah, I was going to say, we probably couldn't pronounce it even if we knew what it was. Um, (laughs) i mean let me be clear too i think my the my muddle comment is less about the what and more about the how i think the way she sort of unfolds these ideas and there's these constant stream of soliloquies that just seem to you know fumble over their ideas and the way they're explaining them and for me i just it wasn't necessarily that i wanted clarity more clarity in black and white but it just felt just so unconsidered I was constantly sort of getting frustrated with the way she was delivering the ideas, and we can get into style and whatnot later, but I think that's where the muddled nature came for me, is that... There's like a couple dozen like idealistic speeches in here that are jammed together in the semblance of, you know, some sort of plot and collection of dialogue. And I I think it would be good to stay with the ideas before we get into the the sort of how, um, for lack of a better description... Um, but that's for me where the muddle comment comes from. Um, you know, I'm not against a, a novel of ideas. It's, it's more about how they're delivered that, and is probably the bigger issue that I have with the book. Um, mm. less it's politics, although we can get, we should probably get into that a little bit. I think we're going to hit it all. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess we're going to get into political novels in general, but this felt like reading some sort of the opposite coin of like an Ayn Rand novel or something. It felt like it had a it had an idea and it didn't execute it fully while also being very much a proponent of a specific kind of ideology. Well, it's funny you bring that up because that's exactly like the, the last time I had such an aversion to a book, it was The Fountainhead. Like I remember <laughs> that last sort of soliloquy, but I think like Gail Winnan, the editor to the to the sort of lackey architect, Peter Keating, and it went on for like 1,700 pages. And I remember I was almost less angry at the politics than I was like, this is the worst written thing I have ever read, right? And again, I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning more on the style part of it, but it is funny how that is exactly the book yeah. that I thought of when I was reading this. Yeah. I mean, that's the emotion that I yeah. get immediately when, you know, they reference uh, the social organism, you know, the, I guess, Adonian, you know, tract. And it has just quotes that they drop in that says, you know, to make a thief, make an owner, to create crime, create laws. And <laughs> you're just like, oh, yeah, yeah, we we get it. That's like a very black and white concept. And it's just delivered in, like you said, this like just, I don't I mean, it's, I don't want to necessarily rag on like the sentence structure and stuff, but it's just, it's very clunky, I think. And you just, if you've ever tried to like write dialogue or look at people who write dialogue very well, it just doesn't really look like this. A lot of telling, not a lot of showing. Right. Sort of what I kept writing down when I was when I was reading this. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, going back to the politics a little bit, I couldn't help but you know we're in the midst of this Democratic primary, and there's this whole debate between like the more straight ahead Joe Biden's and then the more extreme Bernie Sanders, and I kept like thinking in some ways this book is a really (laughs) ham-fisted sort of microcosm of the arguments that in some ways those two kinds of candidates are having right now yeah you know in this primary um which is this sort of more individually driven selfish you know neoliberalism and then this more kind of idealized socialism right and uh so, uh, you know I think it I think it would be worth sort of talking a little bit about are there any ideas here that you know, this book is 45 years old, 46 years old. Are there, is there anything from a, from a subject matter standpoint and its ideas that still feels relevant and maybe why people still read it? I think might be a good question to ask before we go into the nuances of the way it's delivered. Yeah, I was thinking about, yeah, the era it came out and, you know, some of the stuff in here, um, I almost think that, you know, year 2020, we, we might take it for granted, right? But, um, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, the non-hierarchical society, uh, it's very even in terms of gender, right? There's no, there's no difference there, such that when Shevik goes to uh, Eurus, he's completely confused that it's a male-dominated society. And I think not that we're completely there in any way, but that at least is a concept that we are talking about actively right now. 
versus in the 70s where it probably was super revolutionary. And so part of me looks at a lot of these things through that lens of like, is it just that maybe at some level, at least from a discussion standpoint, not necessarily an endpoint, but that the topics feel a little tiresome because we know them by now, not that they're ripping the bandaid off in some sort of like, oh my God, imagine this concept way. Same with like their definition of, um, you know, it's a sex positive society, right? All that stuff. Like, I'm not sure where those, well, certainly 60s and 70s stuff had their own arcs within that. Um, but I just asked myself if part of the reason I find this to be a lot of boring stuff is because those topics start to feel like tropes to me when maybe when they were introduced back in the day, they weren't that at all. I think it's more this book, like Ayn Rand's novels, might appeal to someone who's in high school taking a social studies class and has to write a book report for a final project or something. For a book that's main thread is philosophy and political philosophy, its thinking is is shallow. And that's because it's also supposed to be a novel. And you can't go that far with these ideas in a novel well, especially if it's one that feels somewhat preachy. Or in a science fiction genre novel, which I think attracts a certain kind of reader, arguably a certain age reader as well mm -hmm. you know i think that in you could make the argument from the other end that like very few you know genre fantasy science fiction novels try to insert ideas on this level and so you could argue that it's a trojan horse for people that maybe at a certain age or or who read a certain genre would never otherwise be exposed to mm -hmm. um we certainly can debate the the way and the quality of the way that she delivers them but you know, I'm, I'm trying to come at it from a from a way like when I was 12 and 13, you know, genre fiction was my jam. You know, I read a lot of fantasy and a lot of science fiction. And, it's a gateway you know, drug. Stranger in a Strange Land sort of blew my mind when I was 13 years old, right? Because there were some ideas in there that were a bit more adult than maybe our expectations of the genre usually delivered. And so yeah. um, I, I think that context is a huge part of this. At the same time... I think you're right. It is a little ham-fisted and by in terms of the delivery and also we've just been exposed to this stuff for so long. I mean, I know for me, I kept going, which which one is she in favor is she does she really want this Eurus thing because she's making a good case for you know, I and Rand's sort of argument right now. <laughs> You know, in terms of her individualistic, non, you know, she grew, and Rand grew up in the. Yeah. You know, and maybe that's Soviet. her attempt to sort of, yeah. you know, to muddle it to make it sort of yeah. a description. But, but there were a few moments, like I thought that one of the moments that I did like that made me stop and think was when he's walking down that um, Sam, T Sam Tanavia Prospect Street that has all the shops. And he, mm. and he makes that observation that, like, wow, all the stuff that's being sold here is divorced from who made it and how we see it. And I thought, wow, like that is very appropriate today in the age of our phones, yeah. you know, which are built in China and, you know, d disposed of and who knows where. And, you know, that, that little moment actually felt back in the seventies where I think maybe we were finally starting to think about that stuff a little bit more, but coming off that sort of automated TV dinner, everything sort of being processed, you know, I, I thought was generally an idea that was worth contemplating yeah. again. In and if this you think age. of that, you know, era being sort of pre NAFTA and all that stuff, it yeah. is sort of a little bit ahead of its time. Um, y your comment about like reading this in a certain like age and stuff, I have a descriptor that I use for these types of things and it showed up a, a couple of years ago on a different podcast topic. But to me, this is, this is what I call warp tour art which is if you go to the Warp Tour when you're like a teenager, <laughs> it can be like a life-changing experience because it's a gateway, but you shouldn't be going to the Warp Tour in your 30s. I also think it was the last year, like a year or two ago. Wait, you're not supposed to be going to that Don't tour? go to the Warp Tour, okay, Eric. Okay. Don't go see pop punk bands in parking lots. Okay, all right. But point being is that like there's some introductory stuff and you almost can't fault um, you know, at what point you are exposed to things as long as it asks the question. And I think that's sort of what this is. It's it's very accessible, very, um, you know, sort of high school civics type of topics. And um, I can see, 
like a lot of people really love Le Guin and a lot of people really love this book. And I was very confused by it once I started reading it. But I think I understand that it, it's a potential thing that when it shows up in your formative years, this is a thing that you can lock onto and you're always thinking about because it is very relevant. It's just, I think, not a thing that if you catch however many decades past your formative years, that it can have that same weight. I just just couldn't get around that emotion on my end. Okay. It's a good gateway to anarchism. <laughs> <laughs> like the warp tour. I, I want to ask the yeah. <laughs> I want to ask the question of you know books that you found other people to be super passionate about, who have asked you to read, and then you've kind of read them and you've been like, oh, I'm really not into this at all. You almost feel disappointed by it. But the the other emotion that I got outside of warp tour stuff um, is uh, the book that this reminded me of. That experience is sort of um, what was it? Uh, Ishmael Daniel Quinn. I don't know if anybody's yeah. ever taken a ride through that. That is that just was really, yeah. Foisted upon just, me in high school, and I was like, no, I don't want yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, it's prescriptive to a T, and like, you know, it is just dialogue, and it's, it's freshman year philosophy kind of thinly veiled stuff. And just that, I, I kept thinking of that, like, oh, how do I tell this person that gave me this book that I really don't like this at all? How am I going to talk about this and and know that people might listen and be like, I really fucking love Le Guin. What are you doing right now? And so that's that's my dilemma. So I don't know if you guys have other book experiences like that. Well, there's two for me, one more recent, one more in, in the past. Um, the first one is actually from this club. Another book that I thought of a lot during reading this was <laughs> The Glass Bead Game, yeah, Hessa. Right. You know, there was this whole sort of you know, science, little bit, you know, like Glass B game was less forward with its genre leanings, but I think there was a lot of this kind of like, there's this rigorous form of thought that we follow to kind of get to point from point A to point B. And um, I was not as huge a fan of that book, I think, as other people in our club. And I think part of it for me was that, because that book had been pushed on me for decades and I'd always avoided it because I thought I was done. And part of me when I finished it was like, yeah, I think I would have loved this when I was like 22 and flipping out and, you know, having all these bad relationships and not knowing the way of the world. (laughs) But at that point, it just felt a little simplistic. On the other flip side of that was, um, and it goes back to how we read, right? I think a lot of us read for the actual what, the content, and a lot of us read for the style and the way things are delivered. Hopefully you're reading for both. And I remember somebody pushed Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code on me because they were like, you've been to Italy uh, and you love it Italian art and, <laughs> and you should read this. And I literally got three pages in and was like, there's no way I can read this. It's so badly written. I just cannot bring myself no matter what is in this book. And maybe it also speaks to the fact of what I do, which you know, design by its nature is really about how you deliver the what. Right, The what is usually given to you, and it's really the how you sort of deliver it that's important. And I just, at that point, could not, I mean, this is still 20 plus years ago, but even at that point, I was like, there's just no way I can read this. I'm really sorry. (laughs) David, do you have any other Da Vinci Code horrors? I did read the Da Vinci Code a long time ago. (laughs) Just This was back when I was like, if it's popular, there's got to be something in it, so I'll check it out. And no, that was a mistake. Same with Fifty Shades of Grey. Holy oh, right. Lord. wow, dude, you went there. You're still you're still holding on to that, huh? I can't believe you're not. What sort of, a terrible you know. book! And then in terms of literary, you know, I'll get roped in like other people. You see a book praised enough, you're like all right, I'll, I'll check this out. And I tried reading um, My Struggle by Nosgard. Oh, yeah. I got. I read that. the first one of that. <laughs> yeah, I read the first book. I was like, I can't read six more of these. That is a whole other discussion. Yeah. Dude, yeah. that's all I got to say. We'll table that one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sure there's more. I mean, the last time we did sci-fi, probably, with uh, oh, right. Stennis Love Lem. Yeah. That one was rough. Yeah, that was rough. I got to say, I love that book compared well, so, to this one. Solaris, yeah. yeah. The, the pre that we read, so we did a podcast for a different one that was supposed oh. to be like high Lem, in a way. I guess yeah. we used that term. But it was like, honestly, we're talking about the how of delivery. Like that book was way more just almost unreadable. It was just so, I don't even know, flat. uh, I don't even know. I think it's technically hard sci-fi. 
but like so heavy handed on this like philosophical content and everything else was just not connected in any way. It makes the plot of this book feel <laughs> like super tight. <laughs> um, yeah. So we just, we struggled through that one. But another thing that like that book was very positively recommended by a lot of people saying, oh, this is the best stuff. This is the one. And you get yeah. it and you're just like, oh, I don't. Is this the point where we insert the American dirt part of this discussion? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I mean, also maybe another entire yeah, discussion. No, I'm kidding a little bit. But <laughs> but I mean, maybe, it, maybe it is worth sort of, this is where we dive into these, uh, I think, ideas of sort of taste and what we consider to be good and what we consider not to be good and for what reason. I, I mean, I was, what I was wanted to go back to was like, I don't even think this is a good genre novel. Like I thought it was pretty boring, you know, from a narrative plot standpoint too. Like the structure was kind of interesting. We get his whole story, background story interdispersed with this, mm-hmm. you know, trip he makes to um, Eurus. But I thought who, who would actually read this if it's really about this genre? So who would like read this just for the excitement of the narrative? Because I actually felt it was pretty dull. And so going back to my original ideas, like at the end of the day, even if there is a certain style that I prefer, there is kind of a narrative subject sort of thrust to the books that make them better than this for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think you kind of hit it on the head. There's this book doesn't really know what it wants to be almost. There is elements of hard sci-fi with his theories of time, but that those are far and few between. And then it's both a political novel. There's a sense of... I, I see Le Guin, a lot of literary writers seem to appreciate her more than like real big sci-fi fans. Mm-hmm. And I was trying to find what in here are, do they appreciate? Is it the chapters and the flow of time as some sort of like, like each chapter sort of is both moving forward, but at different points. And that's supposed to be his theory of time. I was, I was, I was trying to find a way to figure out what the novel was trying to do and how it was trying to work. And I just, I really don't know what it ultimately is. I mean, if you're, if you're, if you read this book as almost like a handbook for utopia, you know, and you can (laughs) cherry pick a lot of things out of here that, you know, could be compelling, you know, at a, at a tech startup, you know, Monday meeting or something. You know, I just think that there's there are parts of this thing that mm-hmm. could really resonate individually. But if we're going to really talk about the craft of the book itself, um, this is where you know I, I really feel like it's absolute dreck to be mm. to be com- completely frank. I mean, I just, there were moments where I was like, oh my gosh, this dialogue, I'm going to throw this book at the wall. <laughs> you know, if there's one more like show, you know, tell not show, mo- like long passage in this thing, I-, I don't know if I can get through it. And I think that's really where I, this really falls apart for me. I do not begrudge what she's trying to do here. Everybody should throw out the ideas that they feel are compelling. It's just really the way she does it. I just, it is so not my bag. Yeah. It definitely has um, sort of two within this sort of utopia, dystopia sphere of, of fiction. Um, uh, Jack London wrote a book. It's the, is it the Iron Heel or is it Iron Fist? We'll go with Heel. Uh, Jack London, boy socialist of Oakland, right? But if you read that book, it's just the same heavy-handed stuff over and over. And then the flip side, uh, Huxley, um, after Brave New World, wrote The Island, which is the same thing. It's oh, this yeah. very, like, and you just read those things, and you just want them to be over. And then you think about the, you know, within the sort of classic dystopian, um, like, investigating those things. The books that really succeed are the ones that, for better or worse, are used by all sides of the spe- of the political spectrum because they are meant to be sort of something that you can project onto because they give that mm. we'll go back to ambiguous right but they actually do fulfill that ambiguous requirement which allows people to see in themselves the struggles that these people are going through sort of almost irrespective of, of political ideology versus the ones that i think fail are you know the island and and this and jack london stuff that are just so obvious that it's hard for it's hard to have any space as the reader to even insert yourself into it. Is there a successful utopian novel? Uh, well, I mean, I always argue that all utopian novels are dystopian novels and vice versa, right? Yeah, to answer your question, maybe not. 
And is this one even trying to be a successful utopia novel? I mean, I am I am so suspect of anything that tries to, you know, idealize or dogma or, you know, utopianize the creative vision of that, right? I mean, I just think, I mean, that's just, I think, the nature of maybe living in this era. But um, I think the the novel that I was going to bring up as as part of the argument was was 1984, which I've read literally three times, once in high school, once like 15, 20 years ago, and once fairly recently. And I think what distinguishes that book for me is that there are some very interesting ideas at play there, but Orwell is just a really good writer. Mm -hmm. And so every time you read it, you're drawn in not just by... You might not even be drawn in by the plot or narrative at this point if you've read it enough times, but every time I read that book, I'm just struck by how this is actually a really well-written book. And that's the reason we go back to it, not just because of the ideas, um, but because of the craft too. I think, I think that's right. And I think it's also maybe part of what's happening right now with our complaints is it's easier to root against something than for something. And with yeah. dystopian novels, like Nick mentioned, anyone of any political spectrum could find something to, to fight against. Like there's something, I think there's something in us naturally, I don't know, we want to go there that we like to fight against things we like to push against arguments or at least maybe i do or maybe it's simply that um what we look for in literature is less these deliberate answers and more these provocative questions Mm -hmm. right and i think that this book sits in in a weird middle er area right there's it's sort of like the way it's delivered feels very sort of simplistic and you know not very well crafted but on the flip side, it is trying to at least raise some provocative questions. And that's what I mean by the muddled thing. Again, it's sort of like how it's trying to do it just feels so confused. And like you said, David, it doesn't know what it wants to be. And I think if Eurus and specifically the country of AIO, if it was presented less ridiculously, like it, it's such an easy thing to, to find fault in. I think if it was presented differently, maybe there would be a better balance of like, as a reader, you know, seeing how these things sort of play against each other. But but I found the writing on Eurus to be, well, not only the writing, but the, the scenes and everything there just felt so forced and mm-hmm. incredibly simplistic. Yeah, it goes back to, I mean, exactly what you said a little bit ago, David, about like how much easier it is to rail against something than to be for something. And that like that writing specifically or that section of the book sort of makes me feel like any time I hear somebody just uh, rail against the quote unquote establishment from any direction, because that's just such an easy thing that doesn't mean anything. You're just like, ah, the establishment, I'm against it. And you're just like, well, what happens when you become the establishment? Are you then against that? Or then, you know, how does that flip? And and these are the things that like Orwell did a great job with, I think. And the ideas that I'm struggling with as an adult right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but also, I mean, I just like your comment about Orwell, like the fact that it's so well written uh, sort of jogged in my head that... Um, you know, not that these are arguments for utopia, but that they were a little bit more prescriptive. But Orwell's Down and Out, Paris and London, and Great book. R- Road to um, Wigan Pier, like those things were very straightforward. But those really like pulled emotions out and argued in a certain way that I would say are not terribly different from what Le Guin is is uh, presumably arguing in these books. But they were much more successful and much more moving, and there's some there's legitimate emotional components to them as well. I think that is almost my end point is like how if this is really talking about uh, this Le Guin book is really talking about these ideas that are so big and they are meant to be influencing so many people. How is it so emotionless? Why is there no thing that I connect to whatsoever (laughs) in this book? It's just it's just blank. It's because it's a book of aphorisms with a skeletal scaffolding of a sci fi novel around it. (laughs) Oh, that's actually that's the quote that's on the back of my my, uh, my oh, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is it also, though, that maybe be, maybe she was a little bit um, ambivalent about where she sat on this and just couldn't quite, you know, get her sort of point of view in line as well as the, the writing? You know, I, when I think about Orwell, I'm not a scholar of him, but I know he was pretty impassioned about certain, you know, political and, you know, just moral things. I think he had a very clear vision of what was right and what was wrong. And 
there's an argument to be made that maybe that's what made his writing good too, was that he had a very clear idea about where he stood on things. It was just the way he unfolded those ideas in literature was just much more refined and and better, for lack of a better description. I mean, I can't speak to where she was on this, but you know, when I always go back to Orwell, I, I always get the impression that this guy was a very politically engaged, very strong-willed, you know, guy who had very clear ideas about what humanity needed to do to, to you know, put ourselves on the right side of history. Mm-hmm. So, so uh, maybe a different type of question, uh, but still worth exploring, is sort of that concept of bias being pre-biased before reading this. And specifically, a um, little backstory for the listener is that um, I bought Eric a copy of this book, specifically one that was about $7, and it is the mass market version. It has a lovely, uh, super stereotypical sci-fi cover with the classic uh, neon pinks, yellows, and purples that might be in a 1980s Lamborghini ad. Uh, so how much of that, how much of your opinions on this book are tied to uh, your own emotions of what might happen if you were seen reading that in public? <laughs> I feel like that's directed right at me. Um, <laughs> I think that when the book came in the mail, I was like, wow, excellent. I'm going to be carrying, I'm going to be carrying this <laughs> through the airport or, you know, reading it on an airplane on the way home. And, but I actually also want to credit myself of being very open-minded about this. But I do think that we can't help but bring those implicit biases to it. And I'm going to contend that I went in with an open mind and everything that I feared was more or less confirmed. But I think you're right. I mean, this is, again, goes back to what I do. I mean, you guys aren't old enough for this to remember, but there was the mass market paperback was really the way everything was delivered until like the early 90s, 80, late 80s, you know, the first Bright Lights Big City was mm-hmm. in this vintage contemporary and it was a different size. And it was like, ooh, what's that? And then the Secret History, Donna Tartt's novel came out in this very kind of beautiful, different package. And yeah, I think that design did a really good job of kind of setting the tone, reinforcing this kind of these, these tiers of taste, so to speak. Whereas Penguin Books before was really about we're going to package it all the same way because we want to make sure that everybody, you know, has access to this for one and, you know, should feel like they could read it. And so, you know, I think that, you know, we definitely bring those biases to this and by extension, the kind of books, regardless of their cover design that we read. But I I also, going back to my roots of, you know, the Midwest, I feel like I am very even-handed in terms of thinking about this stuff and wanting to give it a chance. And I gave this a chance. (laughs) I did. Okay. I just feel like it just, the cover just sort of confirmed my worst fears about, you know, reading this after I read it. That's fair. David, which, which version did you have? Full blown sci fi, or do you get like a nicely veiled modern version? He, he booked it. So I, uh, yeah, I I read half of it through a PDF that some commies gave away for free on some website, <laughs> and then the other half I listened to on YouTube, and uh, so, the, the uh, so I went into experience. it. I went I went into it with only my own internal biases, and so uh, you, you just made me think. We tend to quote books we like more, which makes me want to reconsider Panin because we quoted it so much, but I found a right. quote here in this book, and this is during one of the, you know, very prescriptive dialogues. Uh, he's talking to his his sort of radical, more anarchist than anarchist friend, Badap, but uh, he says, Where then is the truth, declaimed Badap, and yawned. In the hill one happens to be sitting on, said Tirin. And I think that kind of gets at this idea of how we all are sort of approaching the same way, but still subjectively. There is a bit of Nietzschean subjective truth in how one reads these sort of books and what they get out of it. Yeah, yeah. Like context that. is everything, as I always tell my students. That makes me feel good about this now. Yeah. I, uh, so I, I tried to explore different Le Guin stuff, and I read, um, well, I guess it's not a trilogy anymore, but I read the first three of the Earthsea cycle, sort of her fantasy stuff. Um, potentially young adult, potentially not, depending on um, what you read about it. Uh, I've also read um, a decent number of her shorts, but I remember I was uh, I was hanging out with some friends and I was talking about this 
and we were previously talking about you know whatever stupid bands we like and then some people talked about video games and then this came up and i basically was not very uh um, positive on the earth sea books i'm not really a fantasy guy but i felt them to be really boring and really obvious and battles of lightness versus darkness and just things like that but as i was doing it i was basically kind of insulting one of my friends who really really likes them and it became this like headbutting thing Whoa. and then uh i'll credit my friend zach as being sort of sort of a person to quiet it down but he made an excellent point that i think is, is valid for repeating which is that like all of this stuff He's like, it's the same. He's like, it's the same if you like doom metal. It's the same if you like video games. It's the same if you like this thing is that you just get within whatever the bounds of it are. And then you start to see the differences and the benefits and the negatives and all that stuff. And then you get into your own levels of nuances within nuances. And then that's why people can read just sci-fi book after sci-fi book after sci-fi book. And that's why I have piles of doom metal records next to us right now as we're recording. And they literally all sound the same. Like I can tell you that very much, but I think that there's something in human nature that for whatever reason, once that taste clicks, you can then get into it. And I think that's just at the end of the day is that this taste just doesn't click for me. Like it's not, it's not delivered in the way that I am into. Like the prose is not really there at all in my opinion. Um, I do think our short stories are a lot closer to what I would call literary uh, styles. And so I do think as a writer, I'm seeing a lot of positive things. But I think it's almost almost unfair in a way for me to be like, oh, this isn't, this isn't my thing because I just don't have that initial clicking of taste, of genre, of view to even allow myself to explore the stuff further. Well, you could also make the argument too that the people who are really into it are so into it that they don't see the... They don't see the edges anymore. They can't look at it from this point of view of where maybe we are, are coming to it. I mean, the other the thing that I thought about a lot, too, was how, and this is more in film, I think, than maybe literature, but how genre movies, I feel like, get a crutch. Sort of like, well, because it's a horror film or because it's sci-fi, right. there are some metaphorical ideas here that, yeah, I know that what's on the surface of this film isn't great, whether it's, you know, Dawn of the Dead or interstellar or whatever it is but the ideas in here are so great or the metaphors in here are so interesting that we should be you know giving this a lot more props and i'm and part of me wants to go no like the craft of this is terrible you know the way it's executed the sheen of it is bad and i don't you know the the good intentioned ideas doesn't mean anything if you don't stick the landing and i think that that is a debate that I think a lot of people have around art and I, you know, when I go to museums with like my engineering friends from Carnegie Mellon, the way they look at it, I'm always like, what? They like it just because of the, it's cool that the, it was the way that it was made. Mm -hmm. And I, but I, at the same time, I can't argue like whatever way they want to go into it is legitimate. But for me, that's something that I really irritates me when we often discuss things that are, have a genre sort of skew to them is that somehow this metaphorical crutch alleviates or excuses the bad stuff that we're seeing in the literal sense right in front of us. Allowances are definitely given with genre that most fans just, they, they take them. And then people from the outside tend to, tend not to be able to look past them. And I think that certainly ha is happening here a bit. Mm -hmm. It has to be, right? Unless we're the crazy ones, because this book seems to be well liked, even beloved. Yeah, just like Ayn Rand's novels are really beloved too. And for me, those are, you know, and I, like I said earlier, it's like it's, I find the ideas fairly toxic. But for me, the reason I despise them so much is the writing. It's just like, are you kidding me? How did this even get published? <laughs> okay, so we've kind of, uh, we've kind of wrapped around this same point over and over genre fiction versus uh, literary fiction and, you know, the crutch that we've talked about and the biases and all that. Um, but I guess my open question to you guys is how, how do you deal with just things that you enjoy? Do you always try to justify them or is it a thing that you can just accept? At this point in my life, I just accept it. I only try to justify it if I'm engaged with a sort of willing sparring partner. So like Nathan and I will often <laughs> argue about things, but it's because we both are enjoying the argument and seeing if we can sort of build on it but otherwise i don't try to go into those unless i know the person i'm discussing the, the topic with 
the art. Yeah. And I think that that's, that's a sort of where I've arrived at too, is just that well, if I'm into it, it works for me. You know, life is short. And if I think about on a weekly basis, how much time I have to actually be experiencing these things, whether it's books or music or film. And, um, you know, maybe I'm not watching, well, I'm definitely not watching highbrow, highbrow film. I uh, have kind of a bottom of the barrel taste in that, I'll admit. But like if it gives you enjoyment and it cancels out all the other shit that you did that week that was less enjoyable. I think I've like arrived that I'm okay with that emotional response. Um, unfortunately, I didn't get the emotional response out of this book that, that validates uh, it being of use or of quality to me. But I think at a conceptual level, that's how I'm actually not against genre fiction or not against these things that fit into certain buckets. Because if it's the thing that moves somebody in a certain direction, if it is the warp tour entry point, I think that I think that works for me. Yeah, I agree with I agree with that a lot. I mean, I'm going to go high and low on this. The first thing is I think if we have this idealized notion of art and what it needs to do, the idea of trying to one sidedly convince somebody that this is great and this is not feels wrong. I mean, the thing that I love about art and sharing it with people is just going, well, hey, maybe you didn't like it or maybe you haven't seen this, but here are some really interesting questions that it raised for me. You know, what do you think about that? Using, using you know, culture as sort of an envoy between people that maybe normally wouldn't be able to speak about it. And certainly in this day and age, I think it's really important, you know, that we kind of not draw these lines and are able to maybe, I mean, if anything, I think this podcast is a great example of us trying to grapple with this in a way that we know people love this so why do they love it we don't love it but why do they love it and I think that's really important and if you can do that in a way that's congenial I think art can be a very powerful thing on the flip side of that you know I am someone as a designer and as a person who's very suspicious of dogma and I think that what I the, what I practice in design is very driven by these sort of taste factors that if you do it this way, it's wrong. And if you do this way, it's right. And, you know, one of my teachers, though, who has this very interesting cornucopia of taste from like, he loves to go to Disneyland to he's really into modernist design. He always said, you know, at the end of the day, it's okay to like what you like. And that's the most important thing. And, you know, for me, it, it, it comes back to that, like this novel was not for me. But I think we did a really good job with grappling about with why it might be. And I think I can see that a little bit clear, more clearly now than I did before we started the podcast. So there's something. There it is. Subjective truth lives on. The hill. On the hill. <laughs> Thanks for listening. As always, you can find us at booksofsomesubstance.com and on Twitter and Instagram with the handle booksosubstance. Should I insult it in the intro?